Hi, everyone. I would like to welcome you with open arms to the Bad Philosopher podcast. I'm your host, Dan Levesque, and today we're going to be talking about vegan ideology. Now, what do we mean by vegan ideology here? Well, we mean the philosophy of veganism. And behind that philosophy is the do no harm principle. That's the idea that you should not do to others what you would not want them to do unto you. And with veganism, we extend this not just to other human beings, but to other living creatures as well. We extend this same courtesy to animals. That's the basic principle here, but before we go any further, I'd like to recount a little bit of a story first. So a few years ago, I was on a trip to India and Southeast Asia. I spent about four months in total in that area, traveling around, backpacking around with my wife, who was at that time my fiancé, my Well, my recent fiancé actually proposed to her at the Taj Mahal on that trip. Anyways, uh, about two, two and a half months into that trip, we ended up in Vietnam. And we'd always wanted to do a motorcycle trip across Vietnam. It's a very long and sort of winding country, so it's perfect for a road trip. Perfect place to go on a motorcycle road trip through. And that's what we did. So one of those days when we were on this motorcycle road trip in Vietnam, we were going down the highway on our little rented motorcycle. And there was another motorcycle up ahead of us going a bit slower with some large object hanging off the back of it. As we got closer, we could start to see what it was. And off the back of this motorcycle up ahead of us was a a big metal bar, sort of perpendicular to the bike, probably about as wide as a car. So it was taking up a good portion of the road and just hanging off the back of this motorcycle. And hanging down off of this metal bar were dangling a few dozen chickens and they were dangling by their feet. They were bound by their feet over and hanging over this bar across the back of this motorcycle with their beaks almost grinding against the pavement as they were motoring down the highway at probably 20 or 30 kilometers an hour at least. And there must have been 30 of them, I'd want to say, at least a few dozen birds. So me and my wife, who again was then my fiance, we'd actually been eating mostly vegetarian for a couple months at this trip. We'd been After traveling through India, we were mostly vegetarian there because it's so easy to be vegetarian in India, and throughout Southeast Asia, there's a lot of vegetarian dishes too, so I don't know, something, we weren't particularly appetized by the meat that was available. And also, the vegetarian dishes were about half the price and probably at least half as likely to have any sort of pathogens in them that would cause some sort of stomach illness, so we mainly just stuck to the vegetarian options. We were also on a tight budget, and we'd already had the run-ins with the D-word, the diarrhea, contracted from some questionable food. Anyways, having not eaten meat for at least a month at this point, we'd been eating it very sparingly, if at all. We were initially aghast at the sight of these chickens up ahead, dangling off the back of this motorcycle, zooming down the Vietnamese highway. At least we thought they were dead. As we got closer and went to go around this guy ahead of us, went to go around this slower-moving motorcycle with all the chickens dangling off the back of it, we went to pass him and I sort of looked down at the dangling chickens, and that's when I saw them moving their heads around, cocking them to the side, and many of the chickens started cocking to the side and looking up at us. The chickens weren't dead. They were alive. They were on the ride of their life, or more accurately, maybe a ride to their deaths their beaks just dangling centimeters from the pavement, and they're strung up by their feet on the back of this motorcycle. At that moment, I kind of decided in my head that I wasn't going to eat meat anymore. I was already going in that direction anyways, but this had just solidified it for me. After this experience, I think I had one more meal that had meat in it, a Korean bibimbap that I got in Singapore that had beef in it. There were no non-meat options where we happened to be, A lot of the food stalls at the place we were at in Singapore were closed for the day. And when I got that, I basically just ended up eating around the beef and didn't finish it. And that was that. I'd already stopped eating pigs about a year before that, and at this point I'd officially taken cows and chickens off of the menu too. So that's in brief my experience going from a meat eater to a non-meat eater. For me, it was a gradual process with each and every animal that I stopped consuming. I didn't just wake up one day and say that I'm cutting out all meat and going vegan or vegetarian. For me, it was just years of gradually cutting out some animals and reducing my animal consumption, and much of the time it wasn't even a conscious decision. So for me, personally, transitioning to a plant-based diet came very easily. 
After that trip about four and a half years ago, I decided to go vegetarian. And then three years ago this month, I went vegan. And these weren't necessarily things that I decided to do just based on what was trendy or based on some sort of ideology. I spent a lot of time thinking about the pros and cons, thinking about all of the ethical dimensions that, to me, made adopting a plant-based diet the right thing to do. And for me, there are three key reasons to adopt a plant-based diet. And I like to refer to these as the three pillars of veganism. Everyone's a little bit different here, so different people will place a lesser or greater emphasis on any of these three pillars. But I'll just briefly touch on what they are and what they mean to me. So the first pillar of veganism is the moral dimension of the suffering of animals. I guess you could say I've always been a little bit sensitive to the suffering of animals, especially when that suffering is produced by human actions. For animals suffering in the natural environment, I feel a little bit less sympathetic, because they are living out their natural life, their natural existence. But the human confinement and abuse of animals is what really gets to me. I remember as a kid I used to collect little wood bugs and put them in a little container. I, I called them spices. I'm not sure why, but they're the bugs that would roll up in a little ball if you provoked them. And I thought this was interesting. So as a kid, I would pick them up and I'd put them in a little container and close the lid. And I remember at one point wanting to keep the container in my room, basically have my own little pets, my own little spices. I remember at some point having a half dozen of them in a container and placing that container on my dresser and leaving it for who knows how long, might have been a day. And a while later, I came back and opened up the container and found all of the spices all rolled up into little balls which I thought was odd because they normally only did this when they were scared for some reason. So I poked and prodded them and they didn't come out of it. They didn't move around at all. In their ball form, they just rolled around the bottom of this container like they were little pebbles or something. So I took them outside and I put them on the ground and they stayed in their little ball form. The spices were dead. And I felt terrible about that. I felt that I, as their benevolent ruler, had let them down. They say that with great power comes great responsibility, and, well, I'd blown it here. And I figured no other spices would ever trust me again once they caught wind of this situation. Really, though, I felt bad. I felt sad that my careless actions had led to the deaths of these little insects. They didn't deserve that. They didn't do anything to warrant that treatment. And I was the one to blame for that. This is a very minuscule and childlike example of what having empathy for other creatures looks like. And probably most, if not all of us, have this same empathy for other beings, whether it be other humans or other creatures that we all share this earth with. I mean, if you're a pet owner, if you have a cat or dog, just imagine what you would feel towards that animal if that animal were to die. That's our capacity for empathy at work here. But for me, the problem of empathy towards the suffering of other creatures is really exacerbated when we look at factory farming. Factory farming produces the vast majority of our meat, and animals living in these conditions suffer through horrendous conditions. And you can easily see this if you just look up some videos on YouTube or something, assuming they're not removed for containing such graphic scenes. And it doesn't require much to feel empathy for these animals in these factory farms. I mean, we kill billions of animals every year just to feed ourselves some meat, in my opinion, unnecessarily. And there can be little doubt here that these animals do suffer. I mean, can your dog suffer? Can your cat suffer? If so, then of course other animals can suffer too, and by all appearances they do appear to suffer greatly. If we are going to grant that animals themselves have some kind of moral status, some kind of value as conscious, intelligent, and sentient beings, then we should be concerned with the amount of suffering that these animals experience when we raise them for food. And for me, this was my primary concern when I began reducing my meat consumption. So the second pillar of veganism is the environmental factor. Animal agriculture is responsible for a significant portion of greenhouse gas emissions in the form of both CO2 and methane. In addition to this, the density of factory farming operations causes environmental damage and can promote the outbreaks of disease. Every densely farmed animal on Earth has some worrisome pathogens that could potentially make the jump to humans at some point. Whether it be brain infections in cows, or swine flu in pigs, or avian flu in chickens, 
there's a high possibility that our next pandemic could originate from one of these factory farming operations. Raising animals for food is also super inefficient from a resource perspective. We put far more energy, calories, and nutrients into animals that we farm than what we get out of them in the form of their meat. For example, in the United States, something like half of all of the corn they grow is used as animal feed. And this amounts to 45 million acres being used to grow corn to feed cattle. And for all of that corn that we put into cattle, we get only a tiny percentage of that energy back as usable food. And all that 45 million acres being used to grow corn to feed cattle, if we didn't have the cattle to feed, we could instead use that land to grow other crops instead. So one of the best ways to directly reduce your impact on the environment isn't to drive an electric car or install solar panels or use less energy. It's actually to reduce or eliminate your meat consumption and consume plant-based alternatives instead. For me, this was the second most important reason to begin reducing my consumption of meat. The third pillar here is the health factor. Now for me, personally, I didn't reduce my meat consumption for health reasons necessarily. I definitely chose to avoid bad quality sources of meat for this reason, but I thought to myself that even if my health was impacted negatively by some measurable amount, I mean, as a runner, I set this sort of arbitrary limit in my head that if my running fitness level declined by some 10%, if I'm even able to measure that, if it declined by this amount as a result of not eating meat, then this was an acceptable impact to my fitness or health, considering the moral implications of my choice. Here I simply placed more value on the problem of animal suffering and environmental concerns than on my health. The results, though, for me couldn't have been better. I mean, since reducing and eliminating my meat consumption, I've seen positive health results in every metric I can think to measure. So, a lot of people do seem to adopt a plant-based diet primarily for health reasons. But I think this is a bit of a myth. I mean, not all plant-based diets are equal. Not all vegans are healthy. There's a lot of vegan junk food out there. But in terms of health, there are a lot of good resources out there that go into how to do this swap to a plant-based diet in a healthy way. For me, it just wasn't my primary concern, but it ended up being a great benefit of making that transition. So these are the three pillars of veganism as I see them. The first is ethical, considering the suffering of animals. The second is environmental, considering the damage we're doing to our environment through factory farming. And the third and final pillar is going vegan for health reasons, though we must concede here that not everyone's necessarily going to feel their best on a vegan diet, and there are lots of other healthy diets out there. So maybe you agree with some or maybe all of these reasons for adopting a plant-based diet or going vegan. But whether you agree with them or not, when it comes to the animals that we slaughter and eat in any given culture, at the end of the day our behavior is mostly determined by social convention, rather than by these ethical, environmental, or health concerns. I mean, just look at cigarette smoking. People don't care about the health impacts here. They choose to smoke and continue to smoke because it's part of their identity. And when it comes to our identity, food is also crucial here. We're brought up in societies where meat-eating is normal and plentiful and celebrated. It's easy to follow the cultural norms and consume the animals you're used to consuming without even thinking about it. That's what I did for years. I find it interesting and fascinating to consider how, depending on where you're born, your preferences for the food you eat, or the animals you eat, or why you eat some animals and not others, can be different. This, to me, sort of hints at the subjectivity of it all. If you're born Muslim or Jewish, you don't eat pork, you're against eating pigs. If you're born a Hindu, you'd be against eating cows. But does it really need to be this way at all? I mean, should we primarily be relying on cultural norms and conventions to determine what's right or wrong here? Lots of things that were formerly social conventions are now seen as wrong. Take slavery, for example, and ethnic segregation in general, child marriage, genital mutilation. In Western countries, we might express our disapproval of female circumcision in some other part of the world, and yet we continue our practice of male circumcision at home. Isn't this a little bit hypocritical? Are some things right just because we practice them? And if that's the case, then how can we say some things practiced by others are wrong? 
There's a laundry list of terrible things that have been social conventions or even allowed by law in the past, and many terrible things still are. I would argue that as rational beings, we do have a responsibility here to think on these things and to give them more thought than just saying, well, that's what we do here. Think of all the terrible things humans have done in the past that were part of the normal social conventions of the time. If nobody ever questioned this status quo, then we would all still be doing them. And as arbitrary as it is, all of us do draw a line somewhere. It's easy for some of us to judge someone in another country for eating animals that we ourselves couldn't imagine ourselves eating. But it's equally easy for Muslims to judge our consumption of pigs or Hindus to judge our consumption of cows. And who's right here? Ethically, we could call this view moral relativism, the idea that there is no absolute right or wrong, but our preference for right or wrong depends on the view from where we stand. Everything is relative in this regard. If you're a Muslim, you think eating pigs is wrong. If you're a Hindu, you feel the same about cows. But if you're living in a Western country, you probably view pigs and cows the same as you view chickens. I mean, a stunningly small number of people discriminate between the three. It seems that, as a person in a Western-developed country, you either eat all three of these animals or you eat none of them at all. There's very little in between here. And for me, seeing how cultural conventions were different in different places is part of what set me on this journey to reducing and eliminating my meat consumption. So several years ago, I actually spent about a year teaching English in China, and I went to some pretty off-the-beaten-path places, firstly in a small town in Zhejiang province, about three hours south of Shanghai. And by small town here, I'm talking about China small, so... Small in China means a city with or a town with a population just under a million people. And then the second place I went to was a bigger city in Chengdu in Sichuan province, basically smack in the middle of China and the very last big city before you reach Tibet. And here they had a population, I think, of 8 million or something like that. So for me, part of what made the experience of teaching English in China so crazy and wild was that when you're out and about, there's almost nobody that speaks any English at all. Big cities like Shanghai are different, but when you get into the less traveled areas with less foreigners, less English-speaking people, very few of the locals understand English at all. So with my experience, apart from staff working at the English language teaching school I was working at, when I was out and about or on the streets, I could not rely on English whatsoever. I mean, they could say hello and they could say how are you, but that's about it. Even students who had been learning English in school for 10 plus years, so high school students, they weren't even close to conversational. They could tell you their name, they could say my name is, but at most they could say a few words of vocabulary and maybe recite a sentence from one of their books or something. So part of the reason for this, I think, is due to a huge shortage of available English teachers. At least this was a problem when I was there, I'm not sure what it's like these days. Most English teaching classes in China are actually taught by people who learned English as a second language, and in many cases they themselves are not even fluent. In many cases, the people teaching English to the new generation of students were themselves taught by a Chinese person who had learned English secondhand. And when you do have a native English speaker there like myself, sometimes you end up with a classroom of 30 to 50 students that dissolves into chaos. And in some of these areas, like where I was, being a foreigner like myself is a novelty to them, and we're more there for entertainment sometimes than we are for teaching a language. Even though I was trained to be teaching English and I was there to teach a language to people, I rarely had the chance to actually do so, at least in the first place that I taught. Most of the time in these gigantic classrooms, I was just playing games and making kids laugh, and they weren't learning English at all. The second school I worked at in the bigger city in Chengdu was actually the complete opposite of that. Instead of having large classrooms, it was exclusively private lessons with one-on-one students. The ages here ranged from as young as two or three to people in their 40s or 50s who wanted to learn for the sake of travel. The school here I was in catered to rich people who could afford private lessons like this. I once even attempted a demo lesson for a nine-month-old baby at the urging of the parents. That's how willing they are there to pay for their kids to learn the language, especially when they have the money for that. 
And here I didn't actually go on ending up teaching this baby. I mean, they couldn't even speak their own language yet, so I was just more there for entertainment and a sort of a photo op as well. But the story I want to get to today was more to do with cultural norms and the odd experience of teaching English in China, which maybe I can get into some other time. At the first school that I taught at, many of their English teachers were Chinese and they had learned English in university. And some weren't particularly proficient speakers. So I started teaching English at this first school at the same time as another guy from the UK. So we were the only two non-Chinese English teachers there. And we were actually roommates as well. And while we were there in our sort of downtime, some of these um, Chinese teachers would spend a little bit of time ta- teaching us some basic Mandarin. And this was super necessary in order to be semi-autonomous in this city. I mean, especially learning numbers were, was super important so you knew how much to pay for things. So something they thought was funny to teach us at this stage was they taught us some swear words in Mandarin. And they taught us the word shabi, a word that means something along the lines of stupid or idiot, and also has some negative connotations relating to vaginas. So saying nishiga shabi would mean something along the lines of you're a stupid blank. Insert a bad word here and maybe you get the picture. Anyways, because it was fairly vulgar, the word stuck in our heads. It was, it was, I guess, funny for me and the guy from the UK to toss this word around sometimes. And I mean, at least the teachers thought it was funny too. So the two of us shared an apartment, and one day when we opened the door to go to the school we worked at, we started class at the same time, so we normally left and walked to the school together. We opened the door, and there was a little puppy sat on the concrete by our door, and it stared up at us. It was this extremely white and fluffy, cute little puppy, and it started wagging its tail and wanting to play with us. We were, we were confused because we had never seen it before. We didn't know where it came from. Our apartment was on the top floor of a four-story building with only stairs, and the puppy was so small it looked like it could barely even get up a single stair, let alone getting up four stories. Anyways, after playing with the puppy for a little bit, we kind of had to stop playing with it and leave and go to the school so we could do our teaching, and we tried to get it to follow us down the stairs. It sort of precariously leapt from one stair to the next, and then sometimes started climbing back up the stairs, maybe because it got scared or something. We decided to name it then and there. We named it Shabi, the Chinese swear word that we'd learned. Funnily enough, by calling it that name, it actually continued to follow us all the way to the bottom of the stairwell. Shabi also happened to be a female, though we didn't realize that before naming her. So at the ground level, our bottom floor neighbors were outside, and they picked up the little puppy, little Shabi, and it turns out that it was their puppy, I guess. They had gotten a new puppy or something. We couldn't communicate with these people at all because they didn't know even a single word of English, so usually just hand gestures and a wave and stuff like that. But from then on, for weeks, little Shabi would come up to our door and play with us in the morning, and she would excitedly greet us at the entrance to the apartment building when we returned home from teaching at the school. So as the days went on, little Shabi started to get very dirty. And sometimes we'd find her outside all alone just laying down by her owner's door, sort of crying on a cardboard box or something. And then she'd see us and want to follow us around and play with us. But we kind of stopped petting her because she was completely filthy and her fur was getting all matted. Which was odd because the same people had another adult dog that was also white and looked really well taken care of. And it seemed they did let the adult dog into the house, but Shabi had to stay outside. So one day we got home after weeks of this puppy being there every day to greet us. We got home relatively late from evening classes at the school, and as we were coming down the block, we smelled an incredibly pungent smell in the air, and it was coming from our apartment building. The smell of something roasting or cooking, it was unlike anything I'd ever smelled before. The downstairs neighbors had a bunch of people over, and they were having some kind of gathering or party or something. They were a lot louder than normal. There was a lot more people. Shabi was nowhere to be seen, and we never ended up seeing that puppy again. So me and my roommate sort of gave each other a concerned look here. The strange smell, the puppy that had greeted us every day for weeks was suddenly nowhere to be seen, and of course we knew that some people in China did eat dogs. If China wasn't such a strange place, it probably wouldn't have even been a thought that crossed our minds, but 
we were continually shocked by our experiences there. Just to segue briefly here, on a different experience we had went at one point with some of the Chinese teachers from our school to a market for a lunch break or something. And this was a market filled with all sorts of strange things. Most disturbing of all, to me anyways, was bags filled with live snakes. That's right, bags full of live snakes, probably dozens of snakes in a bag. And they would be slithering around trying to poke their way out of the bag. It was a horrifying sight that I still think of to this day, and it's horrifying. But the strangest thing at this market was hard-boiled eggs boiled in children's urine. So a regular old chicken egg in a vat of children's urine, hard-boiled, and then they sell the things out of this big vat, scoop them right out for you, and put them in a plastic bag along with a little splattering of urine to go with it. So when I saw this and my coworkers explained what it was, it was hard to even believe it, even though the smell made it clear that it was real. They explained to me that it was believed to bring some kind of health benefits, like greater virility in men or something like that. One of them had even eaten one of these piss eggs before, and apparently the trick is that you need to use children's urine because if they're prepubescent, their urine is pure or something. And this gives those eggs their potency, I guess. I mean, this is what they told me. So I got given one of these eggs in a plastic bag, I think because I showed my interest or something. The person that had them just decided to give one to me for free, and then I ended up being nice and paying for it and all that. I carried it around for about an hour before discarding it. For some reason, the thought had crossed my mind to actually try it, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. For me, that definitely crossed a line. So regarding the disappearance of Shabi from our downstairs neighbors, we never saw that puppy again. And we went to the teachers at our school and asked them if our downstairs neighbors might have eaten that puppy. And their initial reaction was, oh, no, of course not. And then they kind of paused, and they thought about it for a few seconds. And then they sort of talked to each other in Mandarin a little bit, and then they said, well, maybe, actually. They told us that quite a few people in the area we were in actually did eat dog meat. And the province we were in, in Zhejiang province, is actually famous for a long-running dog meat festival. It was called the Jinhua Hutu Dog Meat Festival. And it took place in a city located about an hour and a half drive from where we were located. Um, This festival had actually been indefinitely cancelled in 2011, after having been held annually every single year for something like 600 years consecutively. And that cancellation happened less than two years before we arrived in China to become teachers there. And obviously just because a dog meat festival is cancelled doesn't mean that people stopped eating dogs, of course. And at the time as well, I wasn't really sure where I stood on the issue of dog meat. I definitely didn't want to eat it, but this is where I started thinking that there's not much difference in terms of cognition and sentience between eating dogs and eating pigs. It's really just a social convention kind of thing at this point. There was also another time where we went to a local restaurant for lunch, and it was super local, literally a hole in the wall that you walk into and looks like someone's house. There's zero signage or anything even saying that it's a restaurant, there's no menu. To order, you just had to ask what they were making that day, in Mandarin, of course. So the teachers we were with did the ordering for us, and there was an awful lot of talk back and forth. For a second, it seemed like we wouldn't be eating because they didn't have anything ready yet or something. And then shortly after, it was decided that we would stay and that they did, in fact, have food that they could serve us. When it arrived, one of the things that they brought us was this blackish-looking sausage. And when we tried to ask what it was, the teachers said it was some local special meat, but they couldn't explain what it was because they said they didn't know the word in English. And I don't know, I was pretty off guard at this point because I'd eaten a large number of strange things in China so far, though I drew the line here at the pea egg. So I didn't even think anything of it, I just remembered that it was unique and tasty. And I don't think my UK roommate had any of it at all, actually. I think he was kind of put off by it for some reason. Sometime later, when I was actually traveling through China a little bit, I was in a city in the south of China. And while I was there, walking through a local market, we came across dead dogs that were cooked and hanging on a hook in a market stall. So I think that was the first time that I saw that stuff out in the open like that. First time that I could viscerally remember, anyway. And this made me think back to some of the strange things I had eaten during my time in China, particularly at 
local hole-in-the-wall type places. And it did make me wonder, had I inadvertently eaten dog meat at some point in all of my experiences eating at these local Chinese restaurants where they didn't appear to have any set menu or anything like that? So going back to Shabi the puppy, I have no idea if they ate that puppy or not or whatever happened to it. And I don't know if I myself ever ate dog meat while I was in China, but it seems like both of these things might be possible. I mean, I for sure saw dead dogs hanging on a hook in a market stall, and I mean, this is all coming from a foreigner who does not speak the local language, I'm not part of the culture, and I'm not able to communicate with most people, so I guess take these experiences for what they are, just my perceptions. And I'm not doing this to pass judgment or make it sound like this means the practices in China are horrific or something, or they're all these dog-eating barbarians. In my opinion, if we set aside our biases that are ingrained in us depending on where we happen to have been born or what culture we're a part of, if we discard these biases, it's hard to argue objectively that killing and eating dogs is any worse than killing and eating pigs. The point I'm wanting to make here is that it's these experiences with other cultures that initially got me thinking about the ethical implications of eating animals. And to me, there's no difference between eating a dog or eating a pig, and very little difference between either of those and the practices of eating any other animals, like cows or chickens. For me, though, I had to draw a line for myself, and I didn't want that line to be based on social convention or the ideas of moral relativism, but based on my own thought processes. I didn't want to adopt the mentality that just anything goes if it's a convention that's fine. I decided that I didn't think it would be ethical to eat a dog, ever. And up until that point, I hadn't necessarily taken it off the table. I mean, I wasn't seeking out, I wasn't wanting to try eating dog meat, but but if in some context it had been offered to me, I might not have necessarily turned that down, just for the sake of being adventurous. I mean, even on that trip to India and Southeast Asia, where I ate mostly like 99% vegetarian, I... In Cambodia, I had crocodile meat because I wanted to try it out for the purpose of being adventurous. And when I did try it, I immediately regretted it, too. So I'm glad I never did explicitly get offered dog meat, to my knowledge. I mean, when we are eating meat as part of our normal diet, I think it can be fairly easy to get it in our heads that meat is meat, right? I think it's usually just a matter of how it's presented on our plate. I mean, we don't necessarily think about the animal itself and the life that we're eating when we're eating meat. And even though we do really go a long way to detach ourselves from the process of the slaughtering and the suffering of the animals we eat, I think that on some level we do inherently begin to think about the conscious experience of the animals that we do eat. We're confronted with that sometimes. And this is where, after being confronted with the images of it, I couldn't imagine slaughtering a dog for food. That just seems like it would be so sad. And shortly after this is where I started to think about and do some research on the cognitive capacities of other animals that we normally kill and eat as food. So what I ended up doing was drawing a line for myself. I ended up deciding that there are certain animals that we just should not kill for meat based on some sort of intelligence or sentience factor. I figured dogs are sentient enough that they shouldn't be eaten, as are many other animals like whales and dolphins and primates and elephants. I mean, I'm sure if you tried this exercise yourself, you'd come up with a list of many animals that you would never want to eat because you think it would be cruel for some reason to kill and eat them. And in my research, I decided the same thing about pigs. I decided that Pigs are clearly highly intelligent animals, maybe even more intelligent than dogs are, and I decided that it's unethical to kill and eat pigs, at least for myself. That was about six years ago when I stopped eating pig meat, which some of you may know is pork. We just, we think we're so sophisticated sometimes when we use the word pork to denote what's on the plate, and pig when talking about that animal we associate with dirt and filth. It's kind of funny how we have derogatory words associated with certain commonly eaten farm animals, too. I mean, someone behaving in a certain way, say they're making a mess of themselves eating and we feel embarrassed to be seen with them, we might call them a filthy pig. Or if we're feeling particularly cruel, we might refer to someone who's overweight or obese as a fat cow. 
though maybe this has fallen out of favor a bit since I was younger. And chicken is associated with cowardice. It's funny how much distance we put between ourselves and our food source as sentient beings. Even just giving negative connotations to people using these words can seem to give these animals a lower moral standing in some way. So when I stopped eating pigs, I just cut out ham and bacon. I did use a fair amount of bacon to cook with before that, but this was my first foray into cutting out something specifically for ethical reasons that I had previously been a normal part of my diet. And it really wasn't that hard to do. As soon as I started thinking about pigs from an ethical perspective and considering their moral status as sentient beings, it was easy to stay away from eating them. Maybe I had one experience in the supermarket where I was holding up a pack of bacon and debating in my head what my conviction really was, and I ended up putting it down and setting it aside and never going back to eating pigs again. But along with this also came a little bit of self-righteousness. And this is where the vegan ideology sort of starts to get ingrained in your mind. There's a certain there's a certain level of moral grandstanding here. I remember saying things to my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, sort of hinting at the idea that I was disgusted by her eating ham or bacon. Though to be fair, she ate less meat than I did at this time, though I got on my high horse here and started determining for myself what animals were ethically permissible to eat or not eat. It's interesting to think about because a lot of us do draw a line somewhere. A lot of us probably think the idea of eating dogs is reprehensible, and yet we're perfectly fine with eating pigs because it's something we're used to. But pigs might be more like us, more like humans, than dogs are. I mean, you can transplant pig organs into humans. Nobody's doing that with dogs. And pigs are used in a lot of laboratory testing because they're a close proxy to humans probably as close as you can get without using other primates. Not too long after I stopped eating pork, me and my wife, who, girlfriend at the time, went on this four-month trip where we backpacked through India, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Singapore, and Indonesia. So our first stop here was India, and this was an interesting experience because cows are considered sacred in Hinduism and they don't allow consumption of beef at all. Even their McDonald's replaces beef burgers with vegetarian patties. I tried out the Maharaja Mac, for example. And this is their replacement of the Big Mac. I'm pretty sure the vegetarian Maharaja Mac there, the patty is made out of corn. So it's perfect. Instead of feeding the corn to the cow and then eating the cow as a burger, we're just making the corn into the burger and sparing the slaughtering of a cow. And an interesting thing about India is how many cows there are all over the place. They block street traffic and they saunter along sidewalks. In Delhi, we saw cows rummaging through trash looking for food. In Mumbai, we saw a police officer feeding bananas to a bunch of cows. Sadly, not all the cows in India are treated equally. Some of them live in pretty rough conditions and don't look too healthy. But for the most part, they're just left alone. And there's something about them here, some sort of... I don't know, spiritual connection that at least I felt anyways. You encounter the cows as other sentient beings in this manner. They're, the cows are docile. They're living harmoniously side by side with people, whether in a busy city center or in a rural village. One time we stopped off in a cafe for a snack, and while we were sitting there eating, a cow came to the door and basically poked its head in the cafe, almost as if it were going to walk in and place an order or something. So in India, they don't eat beef at all, and there's a fairly large Muslim population integrated throughout the country that doesn't eat pork. So most restaurants in India have quite a few all-vegetarian options. India itself has the world's largest fully vegetarian population. And then some restaurants will have some chicken dishes or maybe occasionally some pork or goat. But a lot of these meat dishes don't or didn't look particularly appetizing to us at the time, and They also cost twice as much as a vegetarian dish. So the whole time we were in India, we just ate vegetarian. I don't think we really ate meat at all in India until we left. Something about being in close proximity to animals also makes us more sensitive to them and more empathetic towards them. I felt after encountering living cows with their gentle souls so many times in India, but also in other countries, the idea of slaughtering and eating a cow seemed barbaric. Similarly with goats, which you can also find everywhere in a lot of countries throughout Asia. 
It's interesting to contrast how in a lot of these countries throughout Asia, you're sort of viscerally encountering the animals that'll end up on your plate, whereas in Western countries, we're so incredibly insulated from the process. I mean, we don't normally see cows or chickens or pigs or goats or any farm animals unless we see them in a fenced-off field somewhere as we're passing by. But in some places in the world, you see them running around the streets or running around a restaurant or just hanging out side by side with humans. So my experience with these countries just really put me on the fence here with eating animals. I knew at that time already that I didn't want to eat pork, but I felt like I needed to make a decision between cows and chickens while we were in India. Which was more morally permissible to eat? Do you take the life of a single cow that feeds you over multiple meals, or do you take the lives of many chickens for the same amount of consumption? Which animal suffers the most in this process? I googled this, and apparently in the United States, the average amount of meat consumption per person per year equates to either half of a cow or 80 chickens. That means on average, the average American is eating half a cow a year or 80 chickens a year. So if we were going to do a moral calculus here, we would say that calorie-wise, a cow is worth, say, 160 chickens. So if we were going to eat meat no matter what, Would it be more ethical to slaughter one cow or to slaughter 160 chickens? I was wrestling with this idea a bit when the chicken incident on the Vietnam motorcycle happened, and that made up my mind for me. I saw chickens dangling by their feet hanging off the back of a motorcycle, still alive and looking around, and I decided then and there I wasn't going to eat chicken anymore. So as of that day, I was pretty sold on vegetarianism as a lifestyle. And a few days later, I saw a chicken in a market being slaughtered in front of a bunch of other caged chickens and thought, no. And then, after trying to eat a meal in Singapore that had some beef in it, I just decided that that wasn't for me either. So after this trip, I ended up going vegetarian for about a year and a half, though I also occasionally ate fish, so I guess maybe technically I was a pescatarian, but I ate fish fairly irregularly. I remember my last time ever eating fish was actually having a salmon burger on a ferry just after having my bachelor party. And then after my honeymoon in Greece, the transition to veganism happened officially. And this one was actually largely motivated by health. I'd already stopped eating eggs a while before this because I just kind of lost interest in them. I would buy eggs and barely eat them and they would end up going bad and we'd throw out half of them. The biggest change here when dropping dairy from my diet was just eating less baked goods and treats, less junk food, the vast majority of which contains dairy, which is interesting if you look at the labels on packages. So many products you wouldn't really expect have dairy in them. Removing dairy by far had the biggest impact on my health and my body, a far bigger impact than removing meat did. And health-wise, I decided to cut out the dairy because... While I was in Greece, I just ate too much cheese. I had way too much dairy. And eating all of that different kind of cheese, it made my digestion very sluggish. It made me feel sluggish. It felt like a sort of a brain fog that lasted days or weeks. And after that, I kind of just lost interest in cheese. I would never buy cheese. I would never buy products with dairy in them anyways. The only time I would really eat anything with any dairy products was when I was eating some kind of junk food, eating some kind of baked goods or treat or something. And this is what motivated me to just cut out the dairy. And at that point, once I cut out the dairy, since I'd already stopped eating eggs, I was basically vegan. And at this point, I personally would say that I've been vegan for three years now. But when it comes to the vegan ideology, would other vegans necessarily agree that I'm fully vegan? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Because there are a few complicating factors with being vegan and These factors might be different for everyone as well. So vegetarianism is simple. Vegetarians just, they cut out eating meat. So they basically say, I'm not going to eat any dead animals, but they'll happily still consume other animal products like cow milk and eggs and so on. Vegans, though, take things a step further and they cut out all animal products in general. This means no meat, no cow milk, no eggs, and also not using anything else that relies on animal exploitation including leather, down feathers, silk, wool, and honey. So where things do get a little bit more gray area for me when in terms of the vegan ideology is when we talk about the use of honey and wool. 
I personally don't have anything against taking honey from bees. I mean, assuming these bees can be kept sustainably and ethically, I'm happy to blur the lines of veganism a bit here and accept the use of honey. If the bees are happy and well taken care of, then I'm happy to eat their honey as well. Wool is maybe a little bit more difficult. I mean, the performance of wool is hard to match with synthetics, and as someone who enjoys spending time in the great outdoors, there are situations where I think wool is maybe a necessity. So here I would make a concession. I might allow myself wool in some circumstances. Now, the only wool thing I own is actually a single pair of socks from way back before I was vegan, so my consumption here is still extremely limited. But if I were to lose those socks, would I buy another pair? I mean, probably? There are certain forms of wool that are more or less ethical. For example, a lot of sheep go through a process called mulesing, where some of their skin is painfully removed to prevent parasitic infections from occurring. And there are alternative methods that can be used here, mainly just keeping the sheep well taken care of and clean so that they don't get these infections in the first place. So personally, when shopping for wool, I would go for a brand that cares about the ethics of its practices. Apart from this issue, I am of the opinion that sheep being raised for their wool can still have good lives. So again, if the sheep are happy, then I'm happy too. I think where the line really gets blurred here is that at the end of their wool-producing lives, the sheep are going to be sent to slaughter, sent to be slaughtered for food. This means that their natural lifespans are going to be cut short after they've given us a certain amount of wool, they're going to be sent off to the slaughterhouse, and to me that is not ethical. Leather and down feathers are, for me, a total no-go. And I mean, luckily there are synthetic alternatives that are nearly as effective as those are, though. I mean, if we look at a sleeping bag, for example, using down feathers is half the weight and size as a fully synthetic bag with the same performance would be. But in this case, I'm happy to use the fully synthetic bag instead of going for the down feathers. But this does beg a question here. As someone who considers myself an ethical vegan, when it comes to things like wool and honey... Is my acceptance of using them just a matter of convenience rather than being an ethical or moral decision? I mean, when I think back to it, a lot of my reason for avoiding buying meat back in the day before I was even vegetarian was that it was just cheaper to eat vegetarian alternatives instead. I mean, in the grocery store, if the meat option and the vegetarian option were the same price, would I have gone for the meat? I mean, quite possibly a good portion of the time, yes. And then with the concessions that I've made, I mean, I'm happy to use wool because I think their performance is so much better than a synthetic choice. And yet I decide not to use leather or down because I think the synthetic options are good enough for my purposes. So in this way, I'm just making decisions about morality and veganism based on my own personal sense of convenience, I guess. And in this sense, maybe I'm just not a very good vegan. I mean... My transition towards becoming vegan was based off of a combination of my moral convictions, but also out of convenience. I wanted to stop eating meat for ethical reasons, but I also continued down that path partially due to economic reasons, because it was just more convenient to not have to buy or deal with meat. And then similarly with eggs and dairy, I'd kind of just lost interest in them. It wasn't so much moral concerns that drove me to stop eating eggs or stop eating dairy. I just kind of didn't feel like it anymore. It was a preference. When it comes to leather and down feathers, I mean, I never was interested in using those products anyways, so it's easy to be vegan and claim that you have these strong moral convictions when it comes to products that, even if you were a good old carnivore, you never would be using anyways. And then when it comes to something like wool, which is clearly not vegan-friendly and relies on the exploitation of animals, I make a concession here. Because I have a personal preference here allowing the use of wool when I want to use it, despite any moral hesitation behind it. I guess I'm sort of finding a middle ground here. And I do think this is where some of the vegan ideology turns a lot of people off, because it's so extreme. I mean, there are some vegans out there who would probably argue that I'm not vegan at all if I condone the use of wool and honey. So even if I'm reducing, say, 99% of the animal suffering that I would normally inflict by the choices that I'm making, I still can't be in the vegan club for some people? Also, I never 
initially set out on my reductionist journey with the goal of becoming vegetarian or vegan. I simply thought about the food and the animals I was consuming in a more intentional way. And also look at how these thoughts were triggered by visiting crazy countries like China and India where things are done very differently than they are where I'm from. I think this is part of the issue too. It's easier to reason yourself out of social conventions when you're able to step outside of them at all, even for a brief time. I mean, I can't say I would have ever stopped eating pigs if I hadn't had these sort of up-close experiences with dog meat in China and sort of equated the two. And would I ever have gone vegetarian if I hadn't gone to India and Southeast Asia on those particular trips and had those particular experiences? Well, I'm not really sure. At the time when I went on that trip, I had already naturally reduced my meat intake without being too intentional about it, partly due to economics and partly just because I didn't feel like eating meat every day. Before going to India, I was probably eating meat one to two times a week, which is also where it seems a lot of people today are at, on this sort of reductionist or flexitarian food journey. And it really is a journey. I mean, I can't say whether or not any particular approach is right or wrong. It's a matter of personal preference and personal choice and the individual deciding what their comfort level is. I personally don't think I can ever condone the killing of animals to eat their flesh, but some people might be able to justify that. Some people might have well-reasoned arguments for why that is sometimes okay. I think I benefited a lot from moving slowly towards a plant-based lifestyle so that, to me, it just feels more fully integrated with who I am as a person. I didn't just wake up one day going from being a carnivore to decided I'm going vegan. It was a slow and methodical process. So it's not like I'm going to wake up tomorrow craving a steak or wanting to transition back or anything like that. But sure, there are some contexts where I could possibly see myself consuming some animal products depending on the situation. Could I see myself maybe eating fish or some other kind of less sentient seafood at some point, like mussels or oysters or something like that? I mean, maybe, yes. Though in this case, my environmental concerns here are a lot higher for sea creatures than they are for land-based animals. And there might also be scenarios where I could see myself eating something with, say, animal milk in it. For example, I'm really wanting to go to some remote areas in the Himalayas and in Nepal where yak milk is a food staple. And also in Mongolia where nomadic peoples rely heavily on horse milk. I mean, these are all places that I want to go to, and if I'm offered things like this, I can't say that I would necessarily turn them down depending on the social context and whatnot. I mean, I could say from where I am now that I definitely wouldn't be eating any yak meat or horse meat, but... Could I potentially eat something with their milk in it? Yeah, sure. There aren't really any reasonable alternatives in these areas because the environment is so harsh that not many plants grow. So in these kinds of scenarios, if I'm being some adventurous traveler, would I possibly consume milk from an animal? I mean, sure. Would I eat meat? I don't think so. So then I guess the question here is, am I still vegan? Well, I think I am. But there is an element of extremism with veganism that strives towards this sort of purity and perfectionism. The idea that we can't allow any animal exploitation whatsoever. Here, the vegan ideology demands that we radically reorganize society. That we abolish all animal exploitation altogether. I think the idea behind a perfect vegan is someone who condemns the use of wool and honey. Which to me represents a sort of gray area here with veganism. I don't necessarily think that we have to go that far as long as sheep and bees can be kept in an ethical and sustainable way where they can still live happy lives. Although someone with a more extreme view of veganism might say that anytime animals are being exploited, they can't possibly live happy lives. And I think I would disagree with that. Not that I necessarily condone exploitation either. I think a perfect vegan is also someone who watches every step they take to make sure they're not even squashing something as small as an insect beneath their feet. We can't all be perfect here, though. I mean, when it comes to insects, personally, I try to do my best not to harm them. If there's a spider or a wasp or something in the house, I'll try and capture it and release it outdoors harmlessly. If I see a slug moving slowly across a busy trail, maybe I'll want to stop and help make sure it gets across safely without being stepped on. 
But then when it comes to things like mosquitoes, I'm happy to kill those things indiscriminately. And maybe this is some sort of ingrained human bias in us where mosquitoes are known carriers of disease, so we treat them as these morally inferior pests. And I mean, we can certainly try our best here with this principle of doing no harm to others or even protecting other creatures from harm, but we can't be perfect here. We can try our best, but ultimately, the reality is that nature is inherently a place where things die constantly. To me, the main point of veganism is to try to do as little harm to other creatures as possible and to let them live their natural lives to the best of our ability. But if we do take this to an extreme, then interventionism might be a problem here. Say everyone in the world adopts a vegan diet so that we don't kill animals for meat at all, and we do all we can to avoid harming animals in any way at all. And say we also let wild animals come back and thrive and live in their natural habitats. We reclaim the farmland used for animal agriculture to allow wild animals to reclaim those areas. Well, With that, there's going to be a lot of suffering as well. There are going to be predators hunting prey and animals dying and suffering from diseases or injuries all the time. The way some predators make a kill is horrific and brutal. I mean, snatching a newborn calf from its mother right as it comes out of the womb, or ripping out an animal's intestines and eating them while they're still alive and struggling. The natural world is a brutal place. And an interventionist attitude here from this vegan ideology might say we need to somehow protect these animals or something to prevent them from suffering in this natural environment by any means at our disposal. It's an obvious moral problem here if we're going to tell ourselves that killing and eating animals is morally reprehensible and yet we allow this amount of suffering to continue to occur in the natural world. I think most of us could probably agree here that this might be taking things too far that we shouldn't be overly concerned with animals suffering in the natural world because, I mean, that's their natural environment. That's what they would be living in if humans did not exist. And as moral agents here, maybe this is a state of the world that we should be aiming for, a world where all animals, as much as possible, can live out their lives in their natural environment, even if that means that they'll be enduring some degree of suffering within that natural environment. And of course we do catch ourselves in a paradox here. If we're going to say that we should allow nature to take its course, we should allow animals to live in nature and to endure the suffering that nature would provide them, couldn't we also argue that humans are naturally inclined towards eating meat, towards being hunters, towards killing and eating animals as part of our diet? And there's also a fundamental flaw when we talk about the principle of doing no harm to others. I mean, Regardless of how kindly we act towards a shark or a tiger, it's not going to prevent them from eating us if that's what they want to do. So it's not necessarily a reciprocal arrangement here. We could be saying that we're not going to do any harm to animals by all going vegan and not eating them, but they probably wouldn't return the favor. They'd still be animals acting out their natural instincts. We're not talking about a reciprocal arrangement between two moral agents here. It's a sort of a one-sided equation. I think the crux of the problem here, though, is, and probably this is something we can all agree on, is the fact that this modern, industrialized animal agriculture system we have is in no way natural. The animals that are exploited and that suffer through this system are not suffering in a natural way. So if we are going to use the argument that it's natural for humans to hunt and eat animals as part of our regular diet, well... We can't use that argument if the way that we're using and exploiting animals today is in so many ways completely unnatural. I think context matters an awful lot here. I think context might be more important than we give it credit for. I mean, even for me, I've said that there are certain situations where I might consider consuming animal products again, and this would be a bit of a divergence away from my moral convictions as a vegan. When it comes to the context of factory farms, I think this might be where we can find some common ground here, whether you're a vegan or a carnivore. I think it's probably fairly straightforward for a lot of us to agree that the factory farming system that we employ to raise and slaughter animals is deeply unethical. And let's just briefly talk about some of the practices of this animal agriculture industry here in the modern day. I mean, I mentioned that bag of snakes I saw in China where there's dozens of snakes all lumped together in a bag. I mean, that's 
terrifying to me, but it's also morally problematic if we consider the conscious experience of those snakes. I mean, if we could possibly imagine what it's like to be a snake, which surely we can't. Unless your name happens to be Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, maybe. But for the rest of us, while we don't have much in common with snakes, we can probably see that we have a fair amount in common with cows and pigs. I mean, both of these are mammals with feelings and emotions and who raise families and care for their young. And yet, the way that they're treated on factory farms is awful. And the scope of the problem is awful, too. Every year, about 50 billion chickens are slaughtered. And while each chicken's life might not be worth that much when we think about it, when you multiply the problem by 50 billion, it adds up to quite a lot. Chickens that are farmed for their meat, they're called broilers. And in factory farms, they are shoved into gigantic, dingy barns where they don't even have space to move around. They're all crowded in together. They don't see the light of day until the day they get transported to the slaughterhouse in a cramped cage on the back of a truck. And egg-laying chickens aren't much better off. They're typically kept in similarly massive barns in tiny, stacked-on-top-of-another cages where they can't even move around at all. And once their egg-laying slows down to the point of becoming unprofitable, usually within two to three years, they get sent to slaughter too. With these egg-layers, any male hatchlings are completely useless and can't even be profitably raised as meat. But 50% of all chicken hatchlings are going to be male. And all of these are killed and discarded as soon as they hatch, sent alive into a meat-grinding machine where they're turned into feedstock. It would be particularly awful to be a chicken in either of these scenarios. And for the broiler chickens, they've been bred to grow so quickly that they only live for about seven weeks. At seven weeks, they've gained enough weight that they're ready to be slaughtered. Any longer than that, and they would become too heavy for their legs and bones to support their bulk. Keep in mind here that the typical natural lifespan for chickens is at least seven years. Versus seven weeks of suffering in a dark, hot, and cramped environment. Here, for these broiler chickens, the slaughterhouse is almost merciful. Cows probably have it a bit better here. Cows raised for meat might spend the first year of their life at pasture developing before being sent to a feedlot to be bulked up on a dense diet of corn. This diet of exclusively corn speeds up their diet so much that after a few months they'll be ready to be slaughtered for their meat. But the cramped conditions in these feedlots are far from comfortable for a whole number of reasons, and typically a cow raised for its beef will be slaughtered around the 18-month mark of its life, if not sooner. And dairy cows have a similar problem as with egg-laying chickens. After a cow gives birth, its baby is immediately taken away from it. And if it's a male calf, it can be more economically viable to immediately kill it and dispose of it, rather than trying to raise it for a couple months to sell later on as veal, although there are a lot of operations where they do this as well. And these veal calves have miserable lives for the few months that they are alive, often locked into a cage so small that they can't even turn around or lick themselves. And pigs live in similar or worse conditions, usually thrown into a cage or a box where they themselves can't move around. They're rendered basically immobile. And because they're immobile, they burn less calories, meaning they put on more weight for the amount of food that they're given. That's the economic incentive here. And from what I've read, a lot of these pigs end up going insane from boredom because pigs are relatively intelligent creatures, but when they spend their entire lives locked in a crate and unable to move or stimulate themselves, it drives them to the brink of insanity. All of these practices are well documented on video, and if you're someone who does have the opinion that it's ethical to raise and slaughter factory farmed animals, well then, you might want to take a look at some of the videos and give things a second thought. So, this is the context of factory farms. And as a society where the vast majority of people do eat meat that originates from one of these factory farms, this is the type of activity that we're condoning by paying for these products. And sure, we might say that we ourselves could never be so cruel as to treat animals this way or to kill these animals ourselves, and we might say that we wish things could be done differently. But the reality is that with our choices at the grocery store, we're literally paying for this system to continue. When I stopped buying cheap and low-quality meat and started buying better options instead, those better options were more expensive. And that made me buy less meat because paying for the better quality wasn't financially viable for me. 
and as a result I began eating less meat overall. And over time this changed into me dropping meat altogether. The problem with this approach is that paying for a better quality doesn't necessarily equate to animals that receive better treatment. Some factory farming operations are worse than others, but all are awful for the animals forced to endure them. The other option for someone who wants to continue eating meat would be to eat only free-range meat sources or get the majority of their meat through sustainable hunting practices. But this can only feed so much of the population. With the amount of meat that humans currently consume, it would be physically impossible to raise all of that meat free-range. The problem is that we as a civilization just consume way too much meat, and our consumption is only continuing to increase as global GDP increases. We all have choices to make here. What we collectively choose to eat or not eat has a huge impact on other beings, on our environment, and potentially on our health. And here, I'm not so sure whether or not the vegan ideology does more harm than good. In some cases, it seems like the vegan approach can be repulsive to some people. I've seen people be presented with two options in a restaurant, one that says vegan on it and one that says nothing at all. And when seeing this, people sometimes say, well, I'm not vegan, and they choose the conventional option. Even if they were interested in the vegan option itself, the fact that it says vegan on it turns them off, and so they miss out on it. It seems like this might be the result of this ideological battle, this vegans versus omnivores conflict. Like, you have to be- choose a side or something. It, it makes it seem like non-vegans can't eat vegan food, and the vegan food label itself acts like a repellent. So, I made my own choices here, but who knows where I actually stand. I mean, hardcore vegans might not say that I'm vegan, and non-vegans think I'm weird. You don't have to choose a side. You don't have to choose one or the other. You, as someone listening to this, you are a moral agent. And with that comes some responsibility and the freedom of choice. So next time you do find yourself at the grocery store, just remember that your impact on other beings, on the environment, and ultimately on your own well-being is largely decided by your wallet and what you decide to purchase. So that's where I'm going to end things off for today. Thank you everyone for listening. And I'll see you all on the next one.